have been attending a lot of meetings with the government departments, with the Attorney General, with the, the Police Department, and a lot has happened in that period. So we thought it appropriate that we call this meeting to brief you on the developments, what has been happening, and so that you are also kept in the loop, and also to let you know where we go from here. There are a number of speakers who will be speaking on the uh, various meetings that took place, just to give you an overview of what happened there. And then towards the end, we will have about half an hour of questions and answers so that you can uh, have your say, put your suggestions. So whilst these speakers are giving you a, a run on what's happening, if you have questions, please keep it to the end. Inshallah, we will have a time towards the end of the program when we will have that session. So, with that, we have the speakers, and uh, what will happen is that each speaker is given about five minutes. Uh, we want to be mindful of the time, we don't want to be here all night. Uh, so, roughly 35 minutes for seven speakers uh, within which, and then after that, we'll have some other things that we'll be discussing. So the first speaker that we have is our respected Imam, Imam Muhammad Azali. And he will speak of that in Thank you. Just open the slide now. Just open it on his side. Is the USB? Yeah, we'll just do it for now. Manually, you just carry on. Just the next one. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I would like to also acknowledge the presence of Logan, Logan representatives in the AFP that have come here today, also the respected Imams and the community representatives. Um, <clears throat> the topic that uh, I was given to talk about was the outcomes of the recent meetings, and we started off from the beginning. So I'll give you some contextual understandings of what happened that led up to these meetings. Um, 
first of all, on the 10th of September, early morning, we received um, information um, about a community forum, an invitation that was arranged by the QPS, Queensland Police and the AFP. Uh, this meeting um, was arranged for 15 to 20 community leaders and alhamdulillah, many organizations, Muslim organizations attended, uh, the leaders of the, those organizations attended that meeting. So the meeting was about how that morning there were multiple search warrants enforced by the Joint Counter-Terrorism Team, the AFP and the Queensland Police together, and the focus was on two men, and um, they were basically under suspicion for alleged uh, recruitment, funding, and preparation of foreign fighters. Now, the Muslim community, especially the, the Council of Imams Queensland and ICQ, Islamic Council of Queensland, has a good relationship with the Queensland Police and the AFP. We are trying to cooperate as much as we can. We are trying to collaborate with different projects and make sure that we maintain a good relationship. The QPS, the Queensland Police, um, they, when they arrange this urgent meeting, they try to seek our advice when it comes to releasing the media um, information regarding the arrest that took place. When this happened, we tried to understand the context for this. And we understood that in the coming weeks, the anti-terrorism anti um, legislation was going to be um, drafted and released. And also, there were many other events that, that were leading towards this as well. Our concerns was the coincidental timing of such arrests and, and the warrants. So we asked this. Um, we have been in good in, 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 in contact with the police. And we have tried to understand exactly what is going on in our community and also try to re remedy the situation as well. However, it seems like there was some kind of of activities that took place that we didn't we weren't aware of. And also we questioned the fact that the, the charges that these two men were taken in for, were they actually substantiated? One of the charges was for um, possession of a lethal weapon, and the other charge was for funding um, foreign fighters or sending money abroad. Our concern was how come these two things were bunched up in one case? Because it augmented, it made the whole case a little bit bigger than it should have been. So, we started to explain about how we have been constantly targeted in the media and the potential for harassment and hate crimes. So what happened, what happened is that we asked for the police to, um, to con consider the language that they are using when it comes to the media release, and they happily took these suggestions on. I must say that the outcomes achieved during this meeting is that the Queensland Police, they took on these considerations, and they also um, acknowledged that there was a potential for hate crimes and racial vilification. With this, um, one of our community members um, from the Islamic Women's Association Queensland, um, Anti Galila, she expressed her concerns about women being attacked in these kind of circumstances. And she appealed to them and, say, and said to them that we need extra protection because unfortunately the most vulnerable are the women in our community. So these recommendations were taken on by the Queensland Police and with that the meeting concluded. Following that, when we were in the meeting, we started to receive um, multiple phone calls from different news agencies and we questioned how did this information get out to the media even before it was released even before anyone knew about this information how did it get to the media so the we started to discuss and debate how are we going to approach the situation are we going to be proactive or reactive when it comes to releasing a media um, statement so therefore, the Muslim community, all of us together united, uh, unanimously said 
that we will wait until we have facts. We are not going to be um, in a situation where we're going to um, we're going to condemn or say something that we that is not substantiated. So that's why we arranged the second meeting. The second meeting was at the community center, um, the IWAC Islamic Women's Association, Queensland. So this was to propose and determine a response in relation to these uh, arrests. This, um, this meeting was especially for that video system that we we're going to put together. However, because there was a lot of concern in community, uh, a lot of the community members wanted answers towards what is going on, it turned out to be a little bit of an awareness and an information session. So during the session, we explained about the situation, we said that we are trying to help and we're trying to cooperate with all the authorities, but at the same time, we are trying to make sure that it is clear that we Muslims, we won't be targeted and we won't be um, the victims of hate crimes as well. So following this group discussion, uh, it was, uh, Molana was, uh, was nominated to be uh, the media response, uh, part of the, the leader of the media response team. Everyone else agreed and um, they said that if anyone had any media concerns or the media contacted them, there was one person that should be connected, which was Molana well, Uzer. The draft media statement was prepared, but it was not released due to the advice from the lawyers of those arrested. So this is the outcomes, the, 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 the story of, for two of the occasions, and the outcomes achieved, and inshallah, I'll pass it on to for him to continue on with the third meeting. Right, so like everybody. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As well, um, my meeting that I've been asked to um, basically give you an overview of is the meeting with uh, Attorney General uh, Senator George Brandis. Uh, he was also joined by uh, Senator Firavanti Wells. Um, I just wanted to point out that there were some rumors going around that we boycotted this meeting, and nationally you may have heard the word boycott a lot going around. Uh, that was not the case in Brisbane. Um, they gave us um, they gave us an announcement that they would like to meet us, and it was quite short notice, so we requested that they postpone it by another week, and they listened, and we went the following week. Um, in terms of what was discussed at the meeting, obviously, was basically uh, the laws that were being proposed, and they they explained to us that they were seeking the Muslim community's feedback because that's uh, they the government felt that the Muslim community would feel that they were affected by these laws. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so they just wanted some additional feedback. And they highlighted to us, this is actually quite unusual in the Australian legal process. Uh, normally a bill gets discussed in the party room, in cabinet, goes to the party, gets to parliament. Uh, you don't really have community consultation. The community only get involved through their local MP. So it was actually quite a proactive step in that regard. So credit where credit is due in that regard, I guess. The only problem we had was that it was quite short notice and it was quite rushed. Um, having said that, Brisbane was at the tail end of all these meetings, um, and they had practiced a couple. Of, they had a few runs in, Brisbane, uh, in Melbourne and community organisations. Very, very well. Um, it wasn't rushed. It was a, quite a frank, open discussion. Uh, there were about fifty or sixty community leaders invited, and unfortunately, we can't have everybody in the room there. And um, so, those who were there felt like we should have this open forum to just give you an update on what is there. I'm not going to go into too much detail because the overview of the laws is actually an agenda item. So I'm just going to quickly run through um, what I have up here. Um, the one thing I do want to say that the Muslim community met before the meeting, and we met here in this hall actually, and I thought we prepared pretty well. And we had a list of 17 questions in order of priority, um, and we asked them in order of priority as time would permit us to do so. Um, while we had two hours with the senator, um, it wasn't enough time to go through 17 questions, obviously. So we actually wrote a letter and presented to the senator. Unfortunately, we haven't got a response yet, but inshallah we'll get that. Um, the outcomes that were achieved, um, they were quite small, but they were quite significant as well. Um, I don't know if you know, I'll go into this in a very bit of detail a bit later. Uh, one of the um, proposals was to actually remove the expiry dates on three of the laws that were due to expire in December 2015. 
uh, as a community, we put that forward to the senator saying, if it's that um, if it's that severe law, why do we need to have it permanent? Why not? Why don't you just extend the expiry date? And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, we saw in the media that they proposed to extend those expiry dates rather than make it permanent. So that was quite a good little outcome. I'm not quite sure whether we convinced him or he always was going to do that, but at least the outcome was achieved. Um, the other thing that came out, and it was quite an impassionate little speech, um, and the group did it quite collectively, and what is, it was the use of the term Islamic terrorism. And I must say credit to the police that the police members that were there, both AFP and QPS, highlighted that they don't use the term Islamic terrorism, and it was quite clear from the meeting that the government are the people who are using that term. And um, the, the response they got from the room, um, we heard from other uh, ministers later that George Brandis has said he'll never ever use the term Islamic terrorism ever again. And if you follow the media releases the following couple of days after that meeting, that has sort of sort of held through. Um, the ministers, uh, the Senator Brandis, Tony Abbott, they haven't actually used the term Islamic terrorism. Um, so that was a little, a little bit of a win. Uh, and the other thing, obviously, is um, right now they indicated um, a lot of support for community initiatives. And um, so it's probably up to us to probably start looking at those community initiatives so we can actually draw upon that support. Um, okay, I'll hand over to whoever's speaking on me, me for, which is Ali Kadri. Uh, Ali Kadri, as you can see on this list, he's actually doing four and six together, so we'll just do both in one hit. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brothers and sisters. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to talk about two things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the meeting which was held at Holland Park, Islamic Society of Holland Park. This meeting was actually organized by Uncle Rahman Deen from Al Jazeera Society. Most of you will be aware of him. And this was in response to the hate crimes and, and what police and the minister is doing for those hate crimes. Now, the meeting was well attended. It was attended by Minister Glenn Ons, Assistant Minister Robert Cavallucci, Jack Dempsey, and Commissioner Ian Stewart. There were about 30 to 40 people in that room, and all of them raised questions. And uh, we were given enough time to, to ask questions, and a lot of satisfactory answers were given. Uh, the main outcome of that meeting was that uh, the top ministers and the police commissioner showed a lot of support for the Muslim community. They suggested to us that we report these incidents and report it promptly. They also suggested that uh, you know whatever is happening on social media should be reported as well. The other thing uh, which I think we achieved, and, and you rightly pointing out here, is that we built a relationship with these ministers. So since then, we've been able to contact them directly to, to report hate crimes, to talk to them about what has been happening with the Muslim sisters, brothers, and the mosques, and so on and so forth. Now, next thing which I'm going to talk about is going to flow on from this. And uh, Sister Yasmin, you were supposed to speak next, but with your permission, I'll talk about it. So on Sunday morning, on one of the Saturday nights, our Logan Mosque was attacked with very wild posters. So some people came past, drove past Logan Mosque and threw posters with, uh, with very, you know, derogatory terms and, and photos. Uh, that morning, I was called to be at Logan Mosque, and on my way, I thought of, uh, you know, bringing something more out of this. So I spoke to his people in Islamic Society of Wannapak and Logan, and uh, we thought of uh, opening mosques up in response to the hate crime. So we went up there to the Logan Mosque, media was already there, and we spoke about having an open day. And since then, uh, we we got a lot of support from different media organizations for some reason to host this open day. They came in proactively asking us whether we want to go out in public, and it was on national media as well that we hosted open day. Now, as far as Holland Park Open Day is concerned, we had about 200 people turn up that day. And uh, a lot of questions were asked about Islam and Muslims, and most of them were related to the incidents happening. There were some uh, questions about Islam in general, but most of the questions were political, political and what they see in media. And most of the people in that group left uh, with, with a positive image of Islam, and I can tell you that because I'm still in contact with a lot of those people. Logan Mosque had a, had a similar uh, outcome. They had about 40 or 50 people who come in, ask questions. Unfortunately, Logan, the incidents still continue, and uh, we're trying to do more and more to, to sort of spread the message and show the real Islam to these people because uh, a lot of people will understand that whatever is shown in media is exaggerated, and, and people are angry and upset about what's shown in the media, but there are 
quite a large number of wider Australians who believe what they see in media. And, and that was the reason Open Day was organized. Uh, one of the proposals and which, which is for the community to discuss is to have a national or a statewide Open Day for all the mosques and have an annual event. And this is something which all societies can work with. I have spoken to presidents and then the committees of different mosques and they have shown support for this. And uh, I think with the help of and support of the government, we could have a statewide open day in all the mosques one day a year and preferably in somewhere around September because unfortunately September 11 in that week is associated with something very negative and we could twist it to, to something positive which is communication between communities and allow people to come into the mosque I'll give you an incident, I talk about this incident a lot of time. On a park, as you know, it's a 108 year old mosque. I saw him going on to some neighbor who lives two doors down there for the last many years and I asked the person, do you know what we do in the mosque? And there's a crematorium behind it and the person said, yes, you burn people in there. Yes. <laughs> so this this was the level of, of, you know, I can't say ignorance, level of lack of knowledge about what Muslims and Islam and what mosques are all about. So the idea of opening mosques was, was to, to project the proper image of Islam. And I think the outcome was achieved. And after that, a few other mosques, they did, Gold Coast did a very good job with their open day. And uh, I, I just hope, inshallah, we can continue all this. So I won't take much time. I was given more time than, than I needed. So thank you very much. Interesting to see some different faces in the audience. Um, we had a meeting. Um, I mentioned the uh, Friday meeting that was held at Holland Park Mosque with the community, the police minister, um, the multicultural affairs minister. And out of that meeting, the multicultural affairs minister had proposed that there's so much rubbish in the media, um, there's too many people saying all the wrong things, uh, they're not getting the right stories, and there was an opportunity for the Muslim community to be a little bit proactive and for the department to help uh, bridge some of those gaps and those issues with the media. And the idea was to bring um, some people together to say um, these are the Brisbane Muslim spokespeople, um, for want of a better word, um, and if you need different stories, um, different ideas, you can't give it. And if you want different ideas and uh, different people to talk to, because sometimes they want things done fairly quickly, um, whoever they have or whoever they normally talk to um, isn't available, doesn't get back to them on time. Um, and so I think they wanted a, a core group of people that would be able to um, take those phone calls and make those um, statements as and when they So we were called over the weekend to come to a meeting at uh, the department in uh, the city and uh, community leaders were called and from a previous meeting that was held here it was um, said that uh, um, leading up to the George Brandis meeting that if there were television cameras outside like there were in Sydney Melbourne and there was some um, media um, frenzy down there, that there would be certain spokespeople that would address the cameras. Um, it didn't work out that way and uh, Brisbane obviously doesn't rate as highly as other uh, places do, but um, the media weren't overly interested. But from that, there were four people that were nominated that if there were media outside the George Brothers meeting, that there would be, those people would be able to um, address the media. And from that, those four people then were nominated as Muslim spokespeople um, from the government that introduced it from the Department of uh, uh, Cultural Diversity Queensland and they held a press conference on the Monday and introduced the four speakers um, and gave the Exchange Business House and, that, and said that these are the people that if you have issues with them, the Muslim community, please talk to them, get different ideas, get different storylines, access to different parts of the community, um, let's get some good news stories out there. And those four speakers or those four representatives are Nabi Khadri, myself, uh, Nora Amma, and uh, Dr. Abdullah. So they were the four sort of people that were chosen um, to speak. And I'm sure I know Nora's been busy with stuff about um, you know Muslim women being harassed in the street. Uh, which I've been obviously been very busy. I've had 
a couple of post offices with the ABC and uh, the Gold Coast and Korea Mail. Um, so we've all been busy doing our thing and hopefully getting good news stories out there, getting a different viewpoint out there, getting uh, the Muslim voice um, heard from uh, different um, perspectives. That's it. Um, just following on from that good news story, the, the very last presentation really touched on something um, that was historic and really great for our community. And it comes from the Christian churches in the Logan area. So they heard what was happening to the sisters especially who are very vulnerable. Anytime there's any hysteria, any frenzy, any fear about Muslims in Islam, unfortunately, Muslim sisters cop it quite, quite often. And there are quite a number of different um, uh, cases of harassment, uh, whether, whether it was verbal or physical. And so I uh, was in a meeting with a Christian, my Christian interfaith partner, and he said to me, look, you know, the churches want to do something. What can we do something? Because we're hurting it just as much as you are. And what they said to me was that an attack on a Muslim is an attack on anyone of faith. It's an attack on anyone, period, full stop. And so what they did in a matter of one week was to gather 25 different church leaders across Logan and some, some parts of, of Brisbane. And they got them together and they came to Kirby Moss. Now, if you're aware of what happened in Kirby right after 9 Moss was the first mosque burnt down anywhere in the world after 9-11. And so this was very significant. The first mosque, any retaliation, any especially physical retaliation, happened in Kirby. And so they thought, wouldn't it be great if 25 Christian leaders from around the area came over to Kirby Mosque, show their support, call their support, stand shoulder to shoulder with their Muslims brothers and sisters and say, we are one, we are one community, we will take care of you as you will take care of us. So that's what happened last Friday, and it was fantastic. Usually good news stories don't make it into the media, very rarely. But we walked into the Kirby Moss, absolutely filled with cameras from every single channel. Um, I think before that I had about four radio interviews. I had about also four print media and, and one uh, TV media interview. So every single channel, every single media was there and they actually ran the story. So it wasn't just a news story that they came for, they actually ran the story. And they're still running this story. In fact, on the ABC radio on Monday just did a story with the Christian, one of the Christian organizers who led this. So, and I was told that it's actually been seen in other states. And I know that Canberra has been looking at doing something similar. So this is something I think we should be really proud of, the fact that we have such great relations with our Christian leaders and their congregation to say, how can we help you, you know? If a sister's being harassed, can we do a buddy system with Christian sisters and, and Muslim sisters going together and doing what needs to be done? So really that's the outcome of everything that's been happening in terms of the frenzy, the hysteria, and the fear that's out there, that we do have that support from our, our Christian congregations around the area. And I guess what's also highlighted is that the minority of people surrounds out there are due to harassment, but we can't also just you know paint everyone with the same uh, paintbrush as it's done to us. So that was the outcome of meeting seven. Just a couple of the speakers uh, for the change we are running ahead of time, which is very good. Uh, brothers and sisters, as you can see, it's been a very busy period, and the leaders and other brothers and sisters have been contributing in a lot of ways. A lot of them have been attending meetings, a lot of them have been doing things behind the scenes, which you and I are probably are not aware of. It involves a lot of great deal of sacrifice, and we wholeheartedly thank them and support them for the wonderful work they are doing for the world. One of the most important things, as you know, is currently the new legislation that the government is introducing. Part of it was already approved yesterday, as I understand, uh, which is the anti-terrorism laws. It is concerning in some ways. It was a subject of discussion with the Attorney General. So I'll ask for him to come along and just to give you a brief overview of uh, what it is all about, what 
how response has been and where we go from beyond that. I must say that Fahim has been doing a wonderful job uh, in not only organizing this, but a lot of other work that has been there. We'll talk about it a little later, inshallah. Thank you, Hanoi. All right, now the fun bit. Okay, um, the counterterrorism laws. Uh, you've heard a lot about it. Um, first of all, big disclaimer, we're not going to go through everything. Um, the government has done a pretty good job of it. There's a 222-page explanatory mem memorandum, which is written in plain English, so anyone can read it. And it's only the first nine pages that's a summary. So don't be intimidated by the 222 pages. Just read the first nine pages and see what's of relevance to you. And that's exactly what I've done for today. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the things. And the most important one, oh, sorry, it's not, they're not in any particular order. Um, and what I'll say right at the outset is that um, there's a parliamentary inquiry into these um, counterterrorism proposals going on. Uh, they are taking submissions from the public, but the submissions are closing at midday tomorrow. <laughs> so you've got 12 hours. Um, however, we've sort of present, prepared a submission. They're on that table over there. If you want to be part of it, um, it's, I'm going to go through it now as well. If you want to be part of it, please feel free to add your name and signature onto that. Uh, we've been granted an extension till Monday. Uh, but if you can uh, put your name and signature on there, that would be fantastic, and we can make that submission and let our community's voice be heard. Okay, so I'll start, I'll dive right into it. Uh, we've got about half an hour to go through quite a few points. Um, at the very outset, I'll just mention that it's quite a complicated piece of legislation. Even lawyers are really, really struggling with it, and people are a lot, lot smarter than me are debating it out in the media. So all I'm trying to do here is just highlight some of the key things that's in there. And it's basically a bit of my understanding of it as I see it as a layman. And also I've had consultations with a few people who have attended all these meetings. Um, if you want more detail, unfortunately, I won't be able to help you too much. You'll just have to read the explanatory memorandum. OK, so we'll dive straight in. The first one, um, and this is the one you probably heard of a lot. Uh, it's now an offense to go into a declared area where a terrorist organization is taking place. Taking, uh, conducting activities. Um, Senator Brandis in his meeting assured us that a declared area would not be a whole country, it would be small localities and um, probably a bit bigger than a couple of cities, etc. Unfortunately, the legislation that came out a couple of weeks ago said whole countries, in fact, it could be two or more countries. Um, so essentially, the minister at his or her discretion is allowed to declare an area to be a declared area. And what that means is it is now a criminal offence to go visit that country. However, unless you are going for, I think they stipulate five reasons in the legislation. Four of them are sort of like human right, uh, sorry, humanitarian aid related, so it won't affect most of us. Number five was probably the one that will be the saving grace for most people, which is a bona fide visit to visit a family member. Friends, acquaintances. That is discretion. No. Okay. Okay. Well, that is, okay. So it's not a, it's his discretion to nominate. It'll go through to Parliament, and parliamentarians will vote for it. So if that's okay, that's fantastic because that means we as a community can voice our opinion to our MPs, and you can now see the importance of that. So just that mistake I just made highlights the importance of community activity, because. One is the minister can just decide what they want to do, and the other is the community has a voice. So it's very important that we leverage the relationships we've built with these MPs and ministers in the last couple of weeks, and everyone gets more involved in actually getting to know your MP. Um, there's a state election coming up, they're all going to want to talk to you. Okay, um, so use, use it, okay? Use that, use that to your advantage, and we can lobby when that comes, when those declared areas come in. And it's obviously at federal part of this yard, but state MPs can influence federal MPs as well. I'm quite assured of that. Okay, um, all right, so what I'm going to do is talk about this declared area legislation. One of the things, as I said, one of the things is it says you can go visit a family member, and that makes it okay. Okay? Friends and acquaintances aren't included in that. <laughs> so that's it. Our friends, acquaintances, colleagues, you can't, that's not included. So in our submission, we requested that they include that. Um, the next important thing is if you go visit one of these countries during that time, it's up to you to come back and say why you went there. 
and you have to point to the evidence that you went for one of the five nominated reasons. So you come back from your holiday um, to visit a couple of friends or family members at customs, it, it sounds like, um, and that's one of the questions we put to George Brandis and also in our submission, how the process is actually going to work. But it sounds like you may be pulled aside and you may be asked, um, you've gone to a declared area, please show us why you went there. Um, that doesn't um, that doesn't remove the onus of proof. Okay, um, it is basically you point to evidence, and it is up to the government and the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that what you pointed at is not true. Okay, so it's it's a slight tweak, but it's still quite a little bit of an uh, they're imposing a fair bit on people travelling to these areas. Um, so that's one key point. Um, we, it'll be publicly announced, obviously, what a declared area is. It'll be debated in um, debated in the uh, in Parliament, and it'll be all over the press. So you will be quite aware what a declared area is. In our submission, we've requested that they actually explain to us how the customs officials are going to deal with it, because we need to know that when we're preparing to go visit. If we have family members in a declared area, we need to know to prepare for the way back. Um, it's still up in the air in how that's even going to work. Because how do you prove that you went to visit a family member? Who is a family member? Um, so the concern, while we understand, and I think the community leaders said this, while we understand the government uh, feels the need to react to the current crisis, um, the hastiness of it kind of suggests these little details haven't quite been thought through or debated. Um, so. It's quite important that we make these submission, these sort of submissions and actually highlight um, highlight the reason uh, highlight the need to actually argue these cases. And a lot of people are doing that. Uh, even non, it's not a Muslim only issue as well. So a lot of people are doing that. So please try get informed and try get involved in that process. Um, I'll move on to the next issue, which is uh, of worth noting. It's the uh, Australian. Um, the legislation proposals uh, allow your Australian passport and even your foreign passport, if you're a dual citizen, to be uh, suspended for 14 days uh, under certain various circumstances. So again, I'm going to leave it up to you to read the explanatory memorandum to see what those reasons are. Um, the other thing is, if you've applied for a passport or you've owned a passport and that passport's been cancelled or the application's been refused, they've removed the requirement to notify you of that cancellation. Uh, again, I'll leave the detail onto you. Uh, this last one just jumped out at me because they use the word sole purpose. So humanitarian aid in cases of defense for treason. Uh, they've limited it now to sole purpose has to be humanitarian aid for while you went there. So I don't know if that means sole purpose means not say you go to a place for 10 days. Uh, nine days you did humanitarian aid and on the 10th day you went and visited a family member. Is that sole purpose still? I'm not quite sure, I'm not a lawyer, but it just jumped out at me, so I thought I'd put it there. Um, all right, uh, this one I kind of alluded to in the meeting. Um, we're taking the credit for it as Brisbane Muslims, uh, but I'm pretty sure they had this always in mind. Um, it's basically wherever they said that um, there was going to be an expiry of sunset clauses or expiry dates, and these, these laws came in, and there were three things. There were the questioning and detention order, or orders, control orders, and preventative detention orders. Um, the first two, I'm just going, uh, I'm just going off the top of my head. The questioning order and detention order is where they can bring you in for seven days without charge on suspicion of terrorism. Uh, the last one at the bottom is a preventative de detention order, which is where they suspect that you might be involved in something that's about to happen and put you, hold you without charge for 14 days to prevent that event occurring. Uh, the ironic thing about the last one is if you read the government material that's been issued about preventative detention orders, is that if you've been detained for that 14 days under a PDO, um, you're allowed two couples. One is to a family member and one is to an employer. You're not allowed to tell them you've been detained. Uh, they give you the words that you're allowed to say. And the words are, or we'll keep at the subject, um, the words are, I, I am safe, however, I cannot be contacted for a while. Okay, so train your family that if you ever call and say that, that's what's happened to you. Okay, okay uh, the control order regime is a bit more severe than that. Uh, I think David Hicks is probably the most famous person who's been under that. They basically restrict you where you can live, what you can do, who you can talk to, um, where you can work, that sort of thing. 
I'm not quite sure how it works if you own property somewhere, um, whether they can stop you from living in your own property. Uh, but basically, those were the regimes. And they came in after 9-11 in a time of quite a bit of crisis in the community, and but in heightened crisis, and they passed through legislatively quite quickly. But even then, at the time, the government acknowledged that these are quite draconian laws, um, and they could apply to anybody, and therefore we're going to put a 10-year expiry date on all of them. And the expiry dates are December 2015 and June 2016, but recall quickly. These current proposals had that we're going to remove that expiry date and make it permanent. Um, at the George Brandis meeting, we, are, we told him that that basically sets up for a future Nazi Germany in three or four generations' time, potentially. Um, but so they acknowledged that, and they basically said, okay, cool, we'll put in a 10-year We'll just renew the expiry date by another 10 years. Um, ironically, COAG, which is, I think, the Coalition of Australian State Governments, essentially, um, they had recommended a five-year extension for all future extensions. Uh, the government's gone the full 10 years. And the reason they gave in the expiry memorandum is really weak. It's like terrorism is enduring or something to that effect. So there's no reason why it can't be five years. Um, so we should probably lobby for that if we can. And if there's any time left, is there time left? Well, didn't we put it in the proposal? Yes, we have, we have put it in the proposal, but if there's time left, that's just something we really should be pushing for. Um, I'll just have, take a quick uh, detour from here. There's two things we can do. We can waste our time, oh, not waste our time, sorry. We can spend our energy um, trying to fight the laws, okay? And we can just say straight from the outset, look, we don't agree with these laws at all. Uh, you guys are delusional, there is no terror threat, uh, This, this uh, you don't need this, why are you proposing new laws? Uh, that's probably going to fall on deaf ears, given it's got bipartisan support and now. Um, the next one, which is unfortunate, but it's a concessional sort of <coughs> argument. And basically, we concede on certain areas and drive home the strong points and try to achieve some small wins if we can. Okay. Uh, the, part, the support for this, leg this legislation is at an all-time high, like uh, in the polls. Um, has anyone heard of Joe Hockey in the last three weeks? Exactly. Um, so the support for these laws are quite high, and obviously the media doesn't help with the images that we see on the press. So, but I think people haven't been told the story in a, in a way that shows that it affects everybody. And alarmingly, it doesn't just affect us in this room. We could be dead in 50 years' time, um, or 100 years' time. Uh, it's affecting future generations. And in the history books, they're going to look back and they're going to go, which generation allowed a stupid law like this to pass through if, if something um, turns out to be a stupid law later in history? Which generation did that? And we will be the generation that the history books will judge as saying, well, we sat around and did nothing. So I'm not saying, um, all I'm advocating for is that everyone gets informed, become a bit more informed of what the laws are, because it's quite an important change. It's quite a historical moment. And it's very important that we actually make that effort um, and actually get involved and get involved if you can. And obviously, there's been a fair bit of momentum that's come through, and you're all here. And we, later on in the night, we're going to talk about what we can do next as well. Okay, um, so basically, they've moved on for 10 years. And then the last point um, these laws, uh, sorry, these orders or the warrants where they can detain you without charge, they've made some very intricate little changes. Uh, in the wording of what needs to happen um, for them to be able to impose them. Okay, obviously it was too challenging in the past, um, and <coughs> the cynic in you will say they've made it too, too lax now, but I'm not a lawyer, I'm not going to comment on that, but however, they have made very intricate little changes and words that basically required you to reach a certain burden of proof before you can do it have now been laxed a little bit more, where you needed a written order, you can now do with a verbal order, things like that, okay? So the procedural things have changed slightly and it's it's probably worthwhile, and I won't be able to do it justice by talking about it in front of you again. It's probably worthwhile to spend some time reading that explanatory memorandum and just seeing what those little intricate changes are. Um, what I will talk about, um, actually, I'll talk about the first one quickly. This one jumped out at me again. Um, it's not something, it says here that uh, preventative detention order, which is the one where they think you might be involved in something that's about to happen in a couple of days' time or up to 14 days' time. A preventative detention order, they reckon it can now be made when the full name is not known. However, they can identify you as the identified subject. 
So it's quite uh, tricky. I don't know what ways they will have to identify you as the person who's going to be involved in this if they don't even know your full name. Um, but if they jumped out at, at me again, as I said, I'm not a lawyer, but that's probably one to look at. Um, this one here is one positive uh, one that jumped out as well. Uh, if you're serving, an, uh, if an Australian federal police member is serving an interim control order, they have to advise that person that they have appeal and review rights in relation to the matter. Okay, uh, when I talk about intricacies of tiny little things changing, there's one I do want to discuss. And it is about the legal threshold for arrest or under the counterterrorism laws. Uh, they've shifted it from reasonable belief to reasonable suspicion. Okay, but this is consistent. This is nothing new. Okay, all our state legislation, almost all of our state legislation, the burden of proof for arrest is reasonable suspicion. Okay, so all they've done is move the federal one to that level as well. Now, suspicion is defined in the explanatory memorandum. It, it apparently cannot be just a whim or a fancy. There still has to be a fair, a, it's essentially the words a reasonable suspicion. So you almost have to have a reasonable basis to suspect someone. Now, where it's tricky with terrorism is a couple of things, and I'm sure all of you have joined the dots now. Uh, number one, declared area. You come back and you start visiting my family member and whatever you produce, is that quite suspicious? Or like, is that enough to go from reasonable suspicion? Like, I don't quite know. And this is it's this combination of things that makes reasonable suspicion in this context slightly more difficult. Um, the government talks about um, reasonable suspicion um, being the threshold everywhere, but it's, that combination doesn't exist outside of terrorism laws. And that's that's worth noting, okay? Um, they've increased the ability for ASIO to use authorized force in the proposals in executing a questioning warrant. Uh, keep in mind a questioning warrant is still without charge. Uh, and then this other one jumped out at me as well. Um, I'm hoping I read it correctly. Um, this delayed notification of a search warrant uh, for terrorism offenses. Uh, it sounds like, from what I've read, uh, that they only have to issue the warrant uh, within six months of searching your property. Um, so that's a, yeah, it's a little bit different to what's currently the place where you can actually ask for one. Okay, um, here's one that I'm sort of dreading, and there's one positive in it as well, which I'll get to. Uh, it's this new offense, it's called advocating terrorism, okay? And this includes the promotion and encouragement of terrorist acts in addition to the praise of doing a terrorist act. Now, in the modern world of Facebook, is liking something praising? I don't know. Um, okay. um, so it's just a little bit tricky again. So as I said earlier, it's little intricacies that have changed, and it just makes that vagueness and the opaqueness of this whole thing a little bit concerning. And that coupled with how quickly it's being rushed through without, it seems like proper due diligence. Um, they are saying they are doing it. Um, there is a parliamentary inquiry, but then the parliamentary inquiry is closing within two weeks, kind of things from the date of announcement. So it's closing tomorrow at midday. Uh, so I'm not exactly quite sure. And passing through at a time of heightened um, concern throughout the community is actually quite tough as well. That like we may, and even everyone who's actually passing it through, I mean, I'm not being cynical here. They may have actual good intention, and they do. Um, I've got complete faith in the government in having actual good intention for the safety of the people and safety of our, ourselves. Uh, I'm not saying these laws affect me in the sense that I'm not worried these laws will apply to me completely. Um, like it's not a particular concern to me, effectively, but it, it's of concern to every, it should be of concern to every single citizen for the reason that for the reasons that I've highlighted. Um, Advocating, advocating terrorism, I think George Brand has highlighted to us that um, an act of terrorism, one of the two, two of the key elements is it has to be an attack of some sort, a violent attack of some sort, based on a political or religious ideology. Um, the one positive from this, and Brother Ali Kadri and I were laughing about this yesterday, is that as you read it there, and along with the definition of political and religious ideology, uh, something like the ADL on Facebook, could technically fall under that now. So anti-Muslim sentiment, those right-wing groups that are promoting anti-Muslim radicalization could technically, potentially fall under that. So there might be one small positive that comes out of this. Um, I'll move on to the next one. 
Uh, foreign evidence, um, this one's a bit tricky. Uh, basically, they've lowered the threshold again for if you are in a court trial, um, the threshold for entering foreign evidence into, um, into your trial as evidence. Um, at the time, George Brandes, in our, in our meeting, highlighted to us that one of the safeguards they've put in place is that for a bit of foreign evidence to be eligible to be submitted in an Australian court, that bit of evidence would have had to have been eligible if it was Australian evidence in the first place. So the criteria have to be the same, but we're not quite sure if that has portrayed through in the legislation. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly. I read it, uh, it wasn't as crystal clear as the way Senator Brandis pointed out in the meeting. Um, and the other thing, obviously, the conflict at the time of conflict in foreign lands, not easy. Like, we don't know if the, the threshold for fabrication of evidence is easier in foreign countries. Um, Australia obviously has some fantastic standards um, that we all abide by and we all adhere to and ideals that we adhere to. Um, we don't know if bribery may be involved, for example, in getting in evidence from foreign countries. I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but what I'm saying is there might be alternative, um, people may have um, basically evidence that may be not as genuine or as authentic as we perceive it's coming from foreign countries. So there's that fear there. And then the final one that comes in is stopping welfare payments on the basis of security grants. Um, again, security grants could be an alleged, you could be at an alleged state. Um, you could be at a, at a stage where if you're an alleged criminal and you're not convicted um, while this process is going on, it's not quite clear where, at which point they will stop the welfare payments. Um, the argument is that basically, the argument for stopping welfare payments is they don't want taxpayers, taxpayer funded dollars uh, to be going towards foreign fighters, okay, or funding terrorist activities. Um, but it's sort of, it's not clear, a couple of things that aren't clear. One is at which point they'll stop it. Is it at allegations or is it at conviction? Uh, secondly, if it is at allegations and you are found later not to be convicted or you're acquitted and you're found to be innocent, are they going to retrospectively pay you for that with interest? Um, I'm not quite sure. Again, that's, that's the memorandum is quite silent on that. Um, okay. So that's pretty much the key highlights that I drew from it. Um, again, complete disclaimer, it was done in good faith. Um, I may have missed something really important. Um, I don't know, I'm not going to take any, um, I'm not going to try and put forward that I've covered everything, but that should be a good introduction and hopefully I've inspired you to go back and actually read the thing in a bit more detail and find out and find out for yourself a little bit more. And that's the first point, uh, get informed get informed, uh, inform others, read the legislation. Media coverage is pretty good to read at the moment. Um, Organisations like the Australian Law Society and a couple of human rights lawyers. Um, there are review boards, I uh, can't remember the acronym, it's INLMS or something. Like there's, there are government bodies that are actually in place to review legislation. They are releasing media statements. So read all of that, get the balance of you on both sides and form an opinion for yourself. Because as we said earlier, that something like a declared area is actually something um, that we can have an influence on. While it's in legislation, you can actually convince your federal MP, um, you can actually convince your federal MP to promote your view, your community's view, that no, we don't want that to be a declared area. And obviously, we all know we live in one of the most diverse communities in Queensland, if not Australia. So we've actually got a fair bit of say and other people in remote areas are probably looking at us um, to step up to that plate and that's a duty and obligation that we should probably take a bit more seriously. Um, secondly, uh, we've got the issue that I wanted to highlight, don't, let's not make it a Muslim issue. It's not, it's not a Muslim issue. The legislation doesn't have the word Muslim or Islam anywhere. Uh, it just so happens that the likelihood of declared areas are going to be Middle Eastern countries at this stage. Um, I'm hoping for the sake of balance, Ukraine and Russia will be in there as well. Uh, okay, so let's, let's not make it a Muslim only issue. Session is permanent. So once we're there, and it's 
an issue for whichever, whichever group of citizens they are at that time. So, and there will be a new declared area, potentially. Okay, so let's not lose sight of that. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we lose effectiveness of our campaigning. We just make it an us versus them issue and we play that game as well ourselves. Um, thirdly, I've alluded to this already. There are many non-Muslims organizations that are reviewing these laws. Uh, we should join them, follow them, see what they're doing. Okay, um, we should really do, do that. And fourthly, I've again alluded to this, the need for political advocacy. Uh, the Racial Discrimination Act had a precedent. 5,000 submissions were made uh, to get it overturned. Um, and 5,000 were from Muslim organizations. Okay, so there, there is precedent for, to get involved. Um, we've got the submission over there. You can leave your name and number. There's a, the last page is just asking for your name, email address, uh, signature, and uh, phone number. Um, the submission's actually a digital submission, so once you've written your name, we'll just type it up and submit it by tomorrow. And that's it. I'm going to hand over to Sister Salam Erebi. Um, um, Merebi, sorry. And she's going to talk about the reported incidents and safeguards that we have in place. And as um, Uncle Mohammed said earlier, please leave your questions and answers for the question and answer session, and we'll have a panel up here and they'll answer some questions. <coughs> Um, Salam alaikum everyone. So as everyone knows, um, specifically after the recent raids two weeks ago, two weeks ago, yes, um, a lot of harassment on um, Thursday and I remember that day really, really clearly because I was at work, um, received calls 8 o'clock in the morning and I have to leave work to be available as a social worker for my community. Um, and I started getting a lot of calls from sisters about harassment, um, physical, a lot of physical harassment, um, physical harassments that, that are really hard to describe because you would not think that that would happen here in Australia to anyone. Um, even to the extent that last week I actually got a, um, one of the mothers spoke to me and said that her nine-year-old daughter has been harassed um, physically as well in the theme park. So it's, it's getting really, really ridiculous. Um, so myself, Nora, basically Amara, um, Australian Muslim Advocates for the Right of All Humanity, decided to have a meeting with the year 11 and 12 girls from this school because they were raising a lot of concerns as well. Um, and basically we met with the girls and we sat down with them and had a you know, very, very brief discussion on what, how they can protect themselves and what they can do um, to stay safe. So of course, for them not to go at night by themselves without being in a group, unfortunately, even though a lot of them do go to uni nowadays, they have to think about things like that. We also asked um, Sabrina, who's the Muslim police liaison officer, to come around. Um, and uh, Mary, who's also a police liaison officer, and she um, works with the Sudanese community mainly. They came around as well and they gave excellent information to the girls as well. So another thing that a lot of the women can do is you can actually download an app, a police app on your phone, and that app has amazing functions that you can, you know, also use the camera on that, which will record and, you know, you can um, then be able to use that as well for your records. Um, another thing that we also um, told the girls that it's really important to do is um, yeah, so other than, of course, the, the normal phone, phone phone numbers that you would use, and I'm pretty sure the cops here will talk about it more, um, the Anti-Discrimination Commission is really, really important. So the commissioner is an amazing person. We've met with him probably four times now, and he is extremely supportive of protecting the Muslim community. They also... Um, they just recently, I think a month ago, created a page specifically for Muslim women to be able to submit any harassments really, really quickly because normally anything that would go through the internet, you know, there are different ways to do it, but it will take longer than just submitting something really quickly. So the page is called Let Us Know. Let Us, yeah, Let Us Know. Yeah, so if you want to check it, please go online and check it. It's, it's quite an important page. Um, and hopefully, be protected, okay? And if you do have any any problems or you're going through anything, please do remember that we are here to protect you. We are here as your community to be here for you. Um, and Sabrina is a really good asset to also use. Sabrina is the Muslim Police Liaison Officer. Um, 
I'm just going to call up the police uh, superintendent Steve Davenin to just talk to us about what to do in relation to these attacks and if you are a victim of such attacks. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, my name, for those who don't know, my name is Steve Davenin and I'm the superintendent from South Brisbane District. Um, I suppose that one of the first things that I'd stress is that it's very important that police can't do anything to help anybody if we don't actually know. So it is very important to report incidents that are happening to you, crime, any crime at all that's, that's happening. Um, at the moment, the, our organisation is acutely aware of what is going on in the community and the tension that's there. Uh, our police are there to help. They will help everybody, but we must know. We have to know. It's as simple as that. So, uh, and, and with that, I, I will say to people that the best response that you will get from the police is really to call your local police. So sometimes you will find that things will go through networks. It's very difficult for us when they go through individual networks. Um, it does take some time for that to filter through. That's why we have, if it's an emergency, it's triple O. If it's a non, if it's a non emergency call, if, if the, your life is not threatened, uh, 131 uh, that's our police link number. That is for every person in Queensland brings that number. So if you ring that number, uh, you get through to a police call centre, and from that, the, the person that you speak to on the phone, together with you, will make a determination of what response you may need from our organisation. Uh, you can, of course, you can attend your local police stations, but they, they tend to only have people there um, during the day, the work, business hours, and then we have a number of 24 hour stations. But police link uh, is probably your best bet to ring to get the police. The other thing, the other number that's not there um, is Crime Stoppers. Uh, crime Stoppers, if, if there's something you're not sure about, but you want the police to have a look at it, or you think the police need to have a look at a particular um, incident, or something that's going on, but you don't want to give your name, you can go to Crime Stoppers and get information there. <coughs> Um, we also have another thing, if you're, if you're having experiences with traffic related issues, uh, there's also a Boom hotline that you can contact as well and put um, traffic related issues on there. So there's a number of ways you can contact the police. Uh, if you look at QPS, uh, just Google QPS, they'll come up with all the ways that you can contact, all those engagement points. Um, and we are here to help, but we do ask that you'll have to report it to us. That's the only way we'll know what's going on. So. Um, thank you very much for your brief comments on that. I, I think we cannot emphasize the need for reporting incidents. This has been one of the major problems. A lot of people feel oh, nothing happens, so who cares, so don't report it. And in, in doing so, some of the important and major events have not been reported. Uh, and uh, I, I recall last year, at Dara Mosque, somebody had left a pig's head at the gate, and a brother came for the prayers early in the morning, he saw it, he removed it, it, did the good thing, it didn't tell anybody. And it, so the committee came to know about it some six months later, and the matter was never reported. So things like that go unreported, unnoticed, and nobody knows. So it's very important, and I think we all have a role there, that whatever incident, no matter how small it is, it might sound very trivial to you, but I think we all ought to know, and the police ought to know, so that we can all deal with that. Well, I think we're doing pretty well with the time. So the next part, uh, we invite for the Fahim and the Shokat, uh, that is to discuss issues regarding the platform for the community members, how to liaise, how to deal with the community leaders on issues that you might have. So. So first of all, Brother Fahim, fantastic work. Awesome. You did most of the work here. I want to congratulate you and recognize you for that. Um, so I've been thinking recently, I've been talking to Brother Ali, Brother Fahim. We have all these events. 
they finish, we go home, we move on. What happens then? What about the people who can't make it here? You know, I have questions. I've been here five years. I still don't know who are the leaders. I really don't. There's so many organizations. The government gives money to all the Muslim organizations, yet we don't know what happens with that money. How is that accounted for? How does it go to how do you contact contractors? The reason I ask this is I'm a Muslim, you're representing me, but I don't get that. Who are the Muslim leaders? I see some faces here. Uh, they weren't invited to community meetings. So these are the things that's been going through my mind. I've been talking to a lot of people. Now what I'm suggesting moving forward, and by the way, this session is right now being live streamed on Google Hangout. Trip, can you click on the button and drag the window across? Okay, so yeah, it's being live streamed. And I got a message from Mustafa Ali. Everybody knows Mustafa Ali from CCN. He's watching this from, CC, uh, from Sydney. Okay, so I thought, why can't we have meetings regularly, maybe once a week, maybe once a fortnight, anywhere, anytime? Why does it have to be restricted to a physical location? So what I'm proposing here, this is live, right now. Hi, Dad. Hi, Mom. This is live right now. So what I'm going to do, you can move it back to Chip. So what I'm proposing is, if you're interested, ongoing communication, how do we speak to our leaders? How do we speak to them effectively, respectfully, without going to bickering and whinging and moaning? Effectively with respect. How do we do that on an ongoing basis? Um, first of all, there's a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Queensland Muslims. Now, this is being recorded. If you can write it down, great. But if you can't, it's recorded. Secondly, you can send an SMS, the word community, community. Send it to 0430. 370-364. Again, 0430-370-364. Again, this is being recorded, so if you haven't written down, that's fine. Uh, the only problem here is... <laughs> Can you type it in? It doesn't work. Sorry, it's not <laughs> Anyway, it's being recorded. So, well, inshallah, we'll have a regular session. I'd like to invite leaders of the community. So, instead of us talking in the back and bickering and backbiting and saying who's effective, who's not effective, who sucks, who's great, let's come up weekly. Let's go live. You can be anonymous. You don't have to declare who you are. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a regular conversation. Let's invite our leaders. Let's invite the police. Let's invite everybody else from the comfort of their location. You don't have to restrict people. We live in 2014. Anybody else? Anyone interested in this? Anyone? No? Four days, inshallah? So that's it. Other name is Agalon. Uh, just like without the program. Um, that sounds like a great program, and there's actually going to be lots of projects and programs coming up. Uh, we're going to try and keep the momentum of what's happened in the last week, last few weeks. Um, at times of crisis, people tend to come together quite quickly, but the momentum dies down over time. Does anyone remember Gaza? Um, please do. Um, so, Queensland Muslims, um, if you've got a smartphone right now, um, Please feel free to just like the page. What we're going to do is we've, we've created a Dropbox folder which has all these slides, that recording, um, everything will be on there. So that will be our avenue to communicate with everybody. QLD Muslims, so facebook.com QLD Muslims. You've got Facebook, everyone's got Facebook, I think. Um, so if you haven't got Facebook, this is probably a good time to join Facebook. Um, so QLD Muslims, it's a very simple one, and let's go with that. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up with wrap up with two things before I hand over to Uncle Mohammed. Uh, number one, um, I was thinking about it the other day, it's been quite negative lately, and it's starting to draw uh, draw a lot of energy out of people. Um, let's try to remember that it's only a small portion of the society that's actually been quite negative. Uh, similarly, it's only a small portion of the society that's been involved in terrorist activities globally. Um, so, majority of us, um, sorry? That's that? Okay. There's a small portion of society globally of the population that's accused of terrorism, and there's a small there's a small portion that's been accused of racial bigotry. So between in the middle is all of us. Okay. Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay. Allegedly. Sorry. Um, and 
on that basis, we really need to remain positive, okay? And sometimes we really get lost in that negativity. And for the Muslims among us, um, or those religious among us, let's pray. And there's still a lot of positives that can come out of this. And Australia is still a fantastic country, so let's not lose sight of that. Okay, um, and then the fourth one, I just wanted to say, in this time, um, let's, if you haven't been media trained, um, or if you are slightly concerned of your opinion being, uh, potential for your opinion to be construed, uh, just keep in mind the media is out on the lookout for some headlines at the moment, and we are the hot topic for the next couple of weeks at least, and there will be a new hot topic, but for the next couple of weeks at least, we are the hot topic. They are looking for that one five grand quote that makes a great headline. Okay, um, so if you can avoid the media, um, we've, as RTS Mint said, there are people who've been nominated who actually had media training, and they are quite approachable and they're quite capable. Um, feel free to direct the quote to them, and then if you've got a view that you want to express, contact them, and let's just go through one channel that way we can control the message. Um, Brisbane's still small enough the Muslim community that. We can probably do that quite well and come out as a united on a united front of that regard. Okay, um, and in doing that also, just think about how your actions, your individual actions, your personal opinion, will affect those sisters that are getting attacked or um, those um, everyone else in general. Really, like while we may say it's our personal opinion, unfortunately that will get taken out of the soundbite. Okay, so let's just be mindful of that. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Paul Hobbit. Thanks, uh, Wayne. All right, now we're to the final session of the program, which is the questions and answers. And I think uh, we'll probably invite the panel the speakers of to come in front. When you're seated there, it's easier uh, to ask you. So those who spoke on various uh, topics, uh, just bear in mind, please, one question at a time, don't have four or five questions uh, asked uh, at the same time. Mindful of the fact that we have we to give everybody a fair chance. So I'll allow one question from a person at a time. When you are speaking, you can just introduce yourself and you can if you if your question is to the person who spoke on the relevant topic, you can say that this, this question is to that particular person, or if it's just a general question, uh, we will try our best, inshallah, to answer the best we can. So, roughly, although we are ahead of time slightly, but we have roughly half an hour, uh, but we would like to give everybody a chance to speak, uh, ask your questions, and clarify anything that you have. All right, with that, the first question. Uh, the brother there, all right, if you can, yes, if you can just introduce yourself and let us know who you want to ask the question to. My name is Amma, and uh, just for problem for new people coming to this country, but like, very hard to contact which number to start with. It's good to have some people to help with some new people in uh, to figure out what's the problem, like what uh, they want to suffer or something. And then they, they help us to contact the right. Uh, things because we can call them 10 or 20 numbers. So you need to have the uh, 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 mic. Or as a piece of This brother, can you say it again? Uh, uh, as the new people coming to the country, or the English barriers and problems, it's good with the community, the community to help them uh, with one number. You know, if you have any problem, to call this number, and then you start from there, direct you to which one. But one number for one. One number, but I have the uh, attack, so I have police complaint, I have something. I don't know who to call. I have the yellow pages. So the question here is for, the, for those who are watching live stream. The question is, for people who come or who arrive recently to the country, they're not used to the system here. So can we have one number for them to call? Brother, well, thank you. Look, I think that's a good suggestion. We should all take it on board and do something for the new people who arrive. For now, uh, mosques should be your first point of contact. 
and the contact detail of various mosques are there. There are a lot of bilingual people, people who speak Arabic, people who speak English and different languages in the mosques. And uh, if you call a particular imam or a mosque, you should be able to get an answer. But uh, that's something which I'll leave to the community leaders as such. And, and, and for now, uh, Imam Yusuf Peter has nominated to give his number, so you can contact him and pass it on. But mosque is a, is, is a good uh, point of contact for something like that, yeah? My number is 0415-710-618. 0415-710-613. Now, when you're calling my number, don't get your ID locked up. But once your ID is locked up, we can't get older. But if you call my number, I will get back to you as soon as possible. Well. Um, brother. Um, yes, with, uh, with questions about recent migrants or refugees, um, I'm a social worker and I've been working with the migrant community and refugee community for over eight years. So I'm happy for you to contact me if it's in relation to settlement or anything that you need in the community and you don't know how to go around about it um, or any processes that you need to also understand. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy to give you my number as well if you need any of that. It is already advertised, but I'll put it up anyways. Okay, can I have a suggestion? Uh, I think a lot of us use the services of CCN at the moment every Saturday. If you are not subscribing to that, I think if you contact our brother Mustafa and others who are involved with that, the best thing will be that some of these important numbers. We will try, inshallah, to put it in the CCN by this weekend. So that everybody will have, have access that yes, okay, these are the numbers that you can uh, deal with to contact. You know, and if you if you're not subscribing to that, then maybe you should try and look at that, inshallah. It's a simple subscription, so just Google. Yeah, it, yeah. Okay, inshallah, we can do that and uh, what we'll do is on the ICQ website as well, we will do that so that all the mosques uh, throughout Queensland will also be aware of that. All right, moving on. Just want to mention about the masjid. Uh, apparently, we need the number of the masjid that's going to respond. Are, uh, the masjid numbers are there in the uh, website, but I have received a lot of complaints that nobody picks up the number. So somebody from the masjid, from every masjid, must be responsible to pick up. And these are trying time to do that. Why don't we get a hotline, Mulana? Yes, hotline. Yeah. If we get a Muslim hotline, we'll be yeah, there. Which is a good idea at the moment. Okay, Brother Hassan. Yeah. 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 brothers and sisters. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the two uh, brothers that were apprehended and uh, put into jail for so called terrorism charges. What assistance are the Muslim community to help to uh, assist them, number one, and number two, are their families? Can we answer that? It's a very touchy subject, but obviously I'm just wanted to answer. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Uncle, thank you for the question. Look, uh, we have been in contact with the families, and uh, we have said that we are very, very good. But uh, it's the request from the families that these things are not discussed in public. And, and we, a lot of them, few of the family members are here. And there are some other brothers who are witness to that request from the family members. So if, if you wish to find out, I suggest you contact the family members. They don't want this to be discussed in public. Uh, yeah, I, I'm Fadla Wilman, Deputy Director of Islamic Relief, which is the biggest Muslim NGO in the world. I would just like to ask, when this uh, in this petition, is it included that the rights of ordinary Australians, like press freedom issue, uh, are, are they are they are they included there? Uh, the issue of illegal actions, and I would say forget about expiry dates. It is just automatically renewed. It doesn't mean anything really to a politician. So I, I think, 
And and for Queenslanders, we should have remembered what happened in Brazil in fifty years with the low rules. So I think not be too optimistic about giving too much rights to politicians. So that that's the question. Secondly, when we're doing this uh, issue of media, are we explaining what Muslim aid agencies in Australia what good they are doing all over the world? For example. Islamic Relief gave one month's food supply to the Christians who were kicked out of Mosul. Now, are we, we are trying to tell, uh, we, we know what we're doing, other people know, but many other of the Australian community don't know, maybe many of the Muslims don't know what is the wonderful work that Muslim aid agencies are doing all over the world. And I think that is part of our, what we need to show that we're, we're doing, there the, are the hundreds of thousands of Muslims in the world doing good, helping Christians, Hindus, Buddhists all over the world. So I think this is a very important message that we need to get out to the, to, to, to the Muslim community. Okay, um, the first part of that question was, do we pick up on like civil liberties like press freedoms and other freedoms like your right to act, be politically active and things like that? Um, yes, um, one of the questions to Senator Brandis, and it is in that submission as well, is that uh, we raised our concerns with the apparent erosion of your rights to one, freedom of religion was specifically mentioned, and freedom of expression was the other one we've mentioned as well. So your your right to express your views in the sense of um, political activism was an example we've given. Um, however, we're open to feedback. Um, it's still not due for a while, so if you want to email through any voting. Because I think there's a very real problem. For example, the illegal spying on Timor by Asia, or the Dr. Hanif case. The, uh, if, if they were under a special intelligence order, then that nothing could be said in public about that. And this not only affects Muslims, it affects every Australian. So I think this is a really, really serious issue that you cannot expose illegal acts. So that, that I think should be in there. Yes, we'll take that on board. No, 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 I, we've got four days. Yeah, yeah no, we've, got we've had four days. The submission came yeah. out on Monday. And Friday they tomorrow. No, I, 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 you guys have done a wonderful job. Yeah. Just no, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I would go along with that, and especially in recent times with Dr. Hanif, we have all been through the Dr. Hanif case. We, um, you know, we've seen the horrific ramifications of that, and so I think it's timely to remind them of the bungle of the Dr. Hanif case. So I think we, I mean, that's just a one-liner in the yeah. East Timor. So there's no reason why we can't put that in the submission. Now, with regard to your second question about aid, I mean, I'm on the Islamic Relief Board too, so I'm being biased here in saying this, but yeah, you sort of have to understand how the press works. They come to you with an angle. They come to you with a question, and usually that is what the question and the angle is. So there's not really much opportunity to talk about something along the side. So has there been an opportunity to talk about that? No, there hasn't. However, I, in my you know, own uh, capacity, have sort of said that everywhere. I've been to. I know that was mentioned a couple of nights ago at a book launch with Christians and Muslims, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really important to talk about the great things that you know Muslim NGOs are contributing to the world and to Australia. But when you know when the issue of terrorist funding comes yes. up, you can say that will but be. actually yep. most of the funds raised by Muslims in Australia, which is about twenty million dollars a year, yep. goes for humanitarian yep. and development no, purposes. So point. you can add that. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Ahmad uh, Ali Khan. My, my one is next question is just a couple of comments. Did the brother Fahim, uh, can brother Fahim explain that what arrangement you you made uh, to get as many signatory as possible until uh, you call it tomorrow, perhaps till Monday? Like emails to you, uh, many people may not be able to come physically to the to the masjids or, or different location you might uh, identify. So is, is there any other arrangement for that? Um, and my uh, second, uh, it was also in your uh, presentation, uh, the word six months that uh, a warrant can be um, uh, issued. Uh, 
Now, I think while the appropriate uh, uh, person would be the respective QPS officer to explain that uh, letter will to us, what does that mean? Now, my understanding of that is that once the warrant is um, signed by the magistrate or any, anyone, that can be executed within that six months because for the, for the warrant, you are required to nominate date or the dates and time and location of the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the purpose. So that is that going to mean that the one warrant uh, signed an issue for one particular person can be utilized within the period of six months. Is, is, would that be right? Derek Johnson, the uh, Queensland Police, uh, with the intelligence department. But, um, it's a very good question, and, and I'm not totally 100% up on the new legislation, but for a police to execute a search warrant, as you know, we need to go before a magistrate or a judge or a justice of the peace and have a reasonable suspicion that an offence will be committed. We can't go and get an open warrant to, for six months' time on, on you know, that's that's not natural justice. So that that's not what it's there about. I'm suspecting uh, that the the legislation is around a copy of the warrant not being provided within that six months that may um, hinder a further investigation. So a warrant may be able to be executed, uh, but the, the details not uh, be provided to the to the person for a, a period of up to six months. But natural justice is going to occur here. Uh, we're not going to have a warrant that we've got in our back pockets for six months just on the off chance we want to go and execute. So that, that's not the way this legislation is, is, has been developed. I have something I ask for something, So does that mean that uh, uh, every when, when, when a, a, a officer ANC or QPS, whatever you suspect a person, uh, of any suspicious activities, um, you and once you prepare a warrant and signed by the magistrates, that would be for a particular time. Then you have to include particular dates and time. We uh, a warrant is executed. A warrant sworn for to investigate an offence, mm -hmm. and, and a warrant is to search for particular things. Yes, so I'll substantiate that offence. So we have to have a reasonable suspicion then and there or that a person is about to come into possession of certain things that we're looking for. So we can't we can't say we're going to take out a warrant and hold it for six months because we don't have that suspicion that something's going to happen in six months. So the warrant is for then and there uh, and we can't have a warrant issued that uh, is over a longer time period. Okay. Um, uh, I, I actually do, I do prepare and execute warrants as part of my job. Uh, and I am required to provide dates and time, locations, purpose, and that's what it is. The six month, I think, uh, puzzle me and, and make me the why is the six months there. And I, I, I appreciate that you say you're not clear on that. It, it, it certainly won't be for a six month period for us to execute. Uh, exactly. Okay. Sorry, brother. We only have a short amount of time, but this is the reason why we need to continue this conversation online regularly. Okay. Exactly. Who is it for you? Just wanted you to maybe address whatever community members are here now. But what, like this gentleman just said before, that is a touchy subject when we spoke about Omar and I did. It's not a touchy subject, but you should have a little bit, a little bit more background than that. A little bit more support than you saw. You don't have to answer the question, I'm just trying to grab some background. But anyhow, the thing is, I think the community members should be addressed on either approaching their families, supporting their families, however they can. Why are people so scared? It's because they're on terror, terrorism charges, right? Which is absolutely bogus, anyways. But why are people so scared? Just reminder: be respectful. That's all. 
Yeah. Uh, Amsa, I think uh, you were there when we met the family, and uh, you know you are aware of of uh, the support provided to families, and and uh, you know whatever support us as a society has provided, and community leaders have provided. Now, I am telling you absolutely, absolutely that nobody is, is stigmatizing the brothers, right? I knew them before then, I knew them now, now, and now. As far as support is concerned, you know that there is a request from the family not to discuss this. And I want to respect that, and that is why I didn't answer the question. Uh, you are aware of that, and a lot of other brothers are. That, uh, and I want to respect the family. So it's out of the respect that I'm not uh, going into details. So, just to be clear, Hamza, there was a, there was a special meeting uh, about two weeks ago, and I think the meeting was covered where we had about 120 people present. When the brother of the person who is incarcerated at the moment asked specifically not to get involved, and he also said not to make any statement on behalf of of that of those people. So we're not doing it because we don't have any backbone. We're doing it specifically because we've been asked not to do it. Yeah. And for these reasons, uh, on that note, that's why it's a touchy subject. Okay. It's a touchy subject because it's a sensitive subject. We have to respect people. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Subhana Mullah. I'd like to congratulate you and thank you for doing this meeting and congratulate all the other speakers. My question is we are talking to the leaders of the Christian community. We are having open mosques and things. But what, and we are just talking to the people who are in solidarity with us. We are only talking to the people who are converted. What are we doing to get to the redness? We should be doing something to get to the public at large. Talking like this, Alhamdulillah, is good. But we are not talking to the public who is attacking us. Media is not going to help us. And the politicians are not going to help us because they get something out of it. Look, uh, I don't want to be answering all the questions, but that particular topic you raised, a lot of people who came to that open day came with very hostile views about Islam. And, and there are a few people who, I, who were there at that time, so quite a tough question to ask. As far as the leaders of the church are concerned, they have a sway over a lot of people. So there may be people in their congregation who might have negative views of Islam. And one person in particular I know who came to that open day is now fighting tooth and nail to defend Muslims and Islam. In fact, he was in my office there before yesterday asking for a Quran so he can understand Islam to defend Muslims better. So they are they are doing that, and I take that on board. I think the suggestion. My question is, what are we doing to get to the public at large? So you know, open day is one solution, but but look, I'll, I'll pass that on to others. Um, there are a few answers coming up. Um, one example, okay, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of organisations that are involved in the public sphere. One such organisation is Welcome to Australia, and they ran that program called uh, Love for 100 Years uh, with Muslims. Um, they have a national walk that's coming up with every single capital city. Um, we have met with the government this morning, and they've actually given us ten thousand dollars to organise that walk for Brisbane this year. And that we've encouraged the Muslim community to get involved in that. So, are getting involved. So, inshallah, you'll see marketing. As I was talking about earlier, we're trying to build momentum. It's it's a must highlight. You just um, I can't re-emphasize how much of a hasty last three weeks it has been. Okay, like people just haven't had time to breathe. Um, it's literally you. People have been up till three a.m. trying to draft things or write, react. We've been in a position where we've been reactive at the moment. Unfortunately, it's just been that quick. And we haven't got to that point where we can now be proactive. Inshallah, we're getting there. Once things settle down a little bit more, we will we'll get to that proactive stage, inshallah. And inshallah, we'll take any any feedback you have and anyone who has suggestions. I mean, it's all well and good for everyone to have questions. And But if you've got an idea, QLD Muslims, post it on there. If other people like it, they'll support it. People will put projects together, we'll put teams together, volunteers together, and we'll do it. Okay, there's nothing stopping anyone from doing anything they want to do. There's, there's heaps of media, there's, there's heaps of social media campaigns, there's a We Say No campaign that came out of Brisbane, 
there's uh, the WISH campaign, uh, Solidarity. There's a whole thing being happening. So I think it's important that maybe it should be a collective thing. Maybe it should be individual. Each person has a responsibility to put the right side of Islam out there, <coughs> to be the best Muslim they can be so they can present themselves. And that shows that's going to quieten down a lot of remix and that makes sense. <laughs> Well, after that, we might have time for just two more questions, if there's anybody else, so... Uh, this might be a question for the police, actually. Yeah. Okay, if the general definition of terrorism is a violent act that is done in the name of political or religious ideology, then would an attack on a woman because she is Muslim be prosecuted as terrorism? <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, I think some of the things that we, it might be difficult to understand, some of the things that we have to deal with here is there state legislation and federal legislation. State, I'm a member of the state police service. We don't, we don't traditionally deal with federal legislation. Um, I couldn't give you a definitive answer on that. I really couldn't. Um, there's such things with legislation that talks about the spirit of legislation, which is the most appropriate offence for the act that's occurred. And in cases where people are being victims of crime that, that you're speaking about, there is state legislation that covers that and it would be pursued if it was reported and we could identify an offender. So in the sense of you wanting to receive justice as a person who's been wronged, that can be achieved quite easily through state legislation. So we don't have to go to the top of the tree. We certainly have legislation here. There are penalties for crimes against people and that's what we're talking about. Um, and that can be done through state legislation. Our, my message to you is to report crime. That report, and if you assist us in gathering evidence of people who are committing crime, that will also assist us. So I, I hope I've answered your question. Really, we don't have to charge people with terror, terrorism offences if they're committing crimes against you, person to person. State legislation will cover that. Okay. That's a very poignant point you raised. A lot of people are thinking about it. Uh, thank you. Yes, I guess that was pretty much the answer I was expecting. And in a way, it was kind of a rhetorical question. Um, and I'd like to address the brother who's been the main person speaking up by him or something. Yeah, I would actually disagree with you earlier. You said it's not a Muslim issue. It is a Muslim issue. We can say it's not, but it's only for Muslims. The terrorism laws are for Muslims, plain and simple. No question, that's just speaking. So, the other response is fine. That's okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to go over the I'm um, Fendi Fosa from Indonesian community, and I'm not really asking, but I just want to put emphasis into what is really been talking about the one brother uh, talking about the support from the leaders, support from the community, and Sister Yasmin mentioned about the act from ourselves. Actually, my message is mostly to those young people, but several youngs already left. I feel so bad, you know, it's actually my message for them as well is that let's start from our self. <coughs> Don't even look at our leaders, our community, our that, that is coming second or third. What can we do to our Islamic community here in Brisbane, Queensland and Australia? My message is that please have enough with all hatred and all the stuff that hurting us. By the media, non Muslim, or whatever. Don't add the hatred from ourselves. Like posting in Facebook, posting in Twitter about what's happening to our sister. Fine. Mention the problem once. Don't overcome with the problem because that is creating hatred. Please come when there is sister attack, come with the solution. Let's gather together. What can we do this one? Who can we contact? 
Brother Yusuf is our president. Can we contact him? Things like that. Come more with solution and idea rather than report about the attack on the Thank you. This is another good news is this session is recorded. So even if they've left, they can watch it again. This is why the last question. Um, but this is the reason why we need to continue the conversation and not have a one and done event. Okay? Assalamu alaikum. The name is Ismail Mula. I had a conversation this morning with an Australian friend of mine. And it's looking at it from the other side. There's actually a lot of fear on the side of the Australians, or of Australians that I've met. Uh, the fear is he could be walking down the street and somebody would grab him and knife him, or behead him. Right? So when we were talking, I said, hey, look. I'm a Muslim, you know me. He says, well, you're different. <laughs> to the other Muslim. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, we, I don't know how we as Muslims should organize so that we can dispel the fears that the other side has. I basically told him, look, get five of your friends together or get 50 of your friends together, we'll organize uh, dialogues. But we have to understand that the other side also is being. Can I ask you, brother? Yes, yes. 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 Definitely work while listening to his response. Please keep it brief. Alhamdulillah, I meet um, many, many people every day, almost hundreds every day, Muslims and non-Muslims. Mostly I meet the non-Muslims. And I have found that non-Muslims, very good, they are very good non-Muslim Australians, young people, you know, and the solution for this problem, that they are scared of Muslims, is because of me, I myself, I would blame myself because how much I have associated individually with the non-Muslims. Have we ever contact our friends, next door neighbor, make them comfortable, share our food with them? Have we done all these things? Have we collected our neighbors, have a barbecue with them? It is very important as a Muslim, it is important that we should have this association with these young youths. As the youths are having a creating problem today in the mosques, they're saying they're having graffiti and creating problem, putting pigs hair, whatever. Mostly these are youths who are uneducated. You know, there, there are good people there. So the question is, the, the question is how are we gonna go to these youths? How we, my, I would like to ask the leaders, what we going to go, how can we ask, uh, solve this problem with this young generation? What is our solution? Now, respect goes both ways for the panel as well. So I saw some body language that I'm not comfortable with. So can you can we all please maintain respect verbally and also physically because they're going to call it. So that's not it. But uh, you have a question next, yes. um, Brother Amin. Do you want to answer? Yeah, I'll just Does anybody want to answer? Um, I just want to say, first of all, um, let's all remember that we are Australian too. Yeah. So that, that was a big thing for me. Okay, we, we are Australian. Yes, I am a Muslim, but I am Australian too. So that doesn't mean I talk to another Australian there, the other. No, I'm Australian too. Um, number two, we all here work with non-Muslim. We all have non-Muslim friends. Um, with Amara, we do a lot of work with out ruler areas where you know, you would never come in contact with these people unless you actually go out there. Um, Nora can tell you more about that. And she actually meets the people that have so much hatred towards Islam to the extent that, you know, they're, they're just out there to attack her because she's a Muslim. Okay, so she can tell you all about it. She has so much experience in that field. She's been doing it for over seven years. And that's just her by herself. 
we don't have to always do everything collective, co collectively, like the sisters said down there. Um, we can do it individually. I worked with an organization called Together for Humanity when it first started um, probably six or seven years ago. Imam Ghazali works in that organization, and we used to go out to schools out in rural areas and we've never seen anyone with a scarf ever in our lives or anyone that's a bit darker than, than their skin color. So there, there's really good you know, work happening out there. We shouldn't keep on blaming each other, pointing fingers at each other, because people genuinely in this room, everyone here, I believe, really wants to make a difference. And, and, I'll make a difference. Yeah. and I think that's why you saw the body language, because we're thinking, well, this is all the stuff we've been doing. For new arrivals in the country, it's probably a little bit difficult. There's people here, and the families here have been here for 150 years. So we're an old community. We've been doing this stuff regularly all the time. And uh, most of us have probably got more non-Muslim friends than Muslim friends. So that makes it, uh, you've just got to be aware of the community that's around you. So we'll wrap it up tonight after two questions. So Brother Amin and then the director. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is uh, Amin Gardner. I'm um, involved with the OCB as Secretary of the um, uh, Parents Association. One of the things I struggle with is getting people to read. They may read one, two, three sentences on their smartphone and flip back something. That each read the document and understand it and comprehend it is quite difficult. And I see the uh, outcome source for this, uh, this meeting is a well informed Muslim community which is aware of recent events in relation to the counter terrorism laws and is generally united in the onto the challenges we face. I'd like to suggest that because of the difficulty of the Muslim community, and it's understandable for some because they're not of English background and we do generally communicate in English, though there are also other languages that are communicated, but maybe by the sharp cut we become the new Tony Jones and become more professional in the way we present the issues of the Muslim community and put it on YouTube or as well as television or whatever so that people do become informed, they don't have to read, and they're just something more professional and well with all the way. So I'd like to go my Bob Jaffa, just to be a change over. Um, I'll just do this one there. My goal for this YouTube slide and TV discussion is to go into the center, not an expert, detail, I'm far from professional, I don't even start my show now. Uh, thanks everybody for your feedback. Uh, just one comment that I just wanted to make. Um, we use the term leaders a fair bit today. Um, a lot of us here aren't leaders. Um, me, for example, um, probably before today, 99% of you didn't even know me. Um, so it's just a case of, look guys, we're in a bit of a crisis at the moment. Um, and it's probably now is a good time as any to get involved. And that's all it is. Okay, and it's just a case of standing up, doing what you do. As Brother Shamim said earlier, it starts with me. What can we do? Kind of thing, what can I do? Okay, um, so yes, uh, the leaders, or yes, you will need some organization once in a while. Like, okay, we can't all just do 200 different things for efficiency gains. Uh, it makes sense to have a central body to coordinate a few things. But Brother Shankar used the word facilitator. That's exactly what most people here see themselves as. Even the media spokesman, they, I think one of the bullet points we had is they're a conduit for your message. Okay, so they're approachable, their phone numbers up there. So, yeah, let's not just rely too much on the leaders to do our bidding kind of thing, is what the message is like to say. Just in closing, on a positive note, remember it's Eid Day this week. I mean, and this weekend it's Eid, it's a time of celebration. Don't forget, Dream World next weekend. <laughs> let's all go and have a party. <laughs> And I'm serious about that. Get your tickets because last give year. Give her a plug. Can I just say, last year we turned away 300 people at the door because we sold out. So get your tickets because if you get to Dream World, there's no tickets left. You're going to have to come all the way back. Final questions before. I just like to ask one question, two questions. One is do we emphasize that 40% of Muslims were born in Australia? You know? We should. Have we been emphasizing that yeah, it's not have. whole? Have we had? Okay, yeah. fine. It's, it's just a question. Yeah, and, and the other one, how far have we been sending 
thanks and congratulations to to like some that Melissa, Melissa. Uh, Melissa yeah, and 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 even Andrew Bow bless his <laughs> bless his soul. <laughs> actually, even, are we going to say thank you to people even that is against us? But are we going to appreciate? <laughs> no, if you see his no, I'm, I'm, okay. What I'm emphasizing is yeah. that we need to thank people for positive things they do. Andrew Bolt said this is a free country, and if somebody wants to wear a burqa, they should be able to. Yeah, he wants to get rid of all of us. Yeah, I know, but okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, the thank you thing is yeah, yeah. sure we can and we are appreciative. Uh, whether there's always a need for a public thank you, and we're just grateful for everything, I'm not 100% sure. I don't thank my friends every time they give me a lift. Um, however, I just want to highlight one example of where we did, or actually two examples of where we did do community organized thank yous. The one was Love for 100 Years, the campaign, where a bunch of uh, Christian leaders and Jewish leaders came together, and out of the blue, they just said, that's enough. We have enough sneering of Muslims in the media. We need to stand up and say something. And that was really out of the goodness of their heart and we were quite moved by that and 53 organizations added their name to a letter to them saying thank you okay um and uh, ironically i mentioned welcome to australia earlier they were one of the lead organizations now we're all working together so that was thank you but it's strategic to move forward the other one we did was campbell newman when he came out with some really strong words in support of the muslim community again it was a leader uh, thanking him had strategic um benefits as well um but to have to say thank you to the lives of Andrew Ball. I think some people would have difficulties with that. No, that's okay. We are grateful. I wasn't serious. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we are grateful. We are grateful. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> since you mentioned uh, politician, I don't belong to any party, but uh, uh, respect to Grant Hill, actually, the other day on ABC, used some very favorite words for the Muslim, especially in the mentioned the and Nikab, and these sort of things, you know? So, we come to the end, but this is not the end. There's a lot, there's a lot, lot more happening, than a lot more meetings. There's another meeting next week, in years. And it's, as we have been saying, that some of us are involved, but it's also time that others get involved also. There are ways in which you can contribute, and ways you can give the feedback, so that we can all learn, and I'm sure that you'll agree that this particular meeting has been a very positive one. Uh, it's been a learning process for all of us. We, we, we are able to learn and share from each other. And inshallah, if we keep up the spirit, we, we can all benefit from that. Just quickly before we close, and that come from what, what happened here tonight. There's one thing that I think is very important that somebody needs to about the Muslim Pokemon. We have one on the Facebook or on the, on the computer. Guys, if you should look at uh, Muslim Pokemon, and that's the then uh, Yeah, okay. Yeah, there are some, some posters that have come from it, which are now look at it. So we did. Thank you. And the last uh, Imam here to make the final dua. <laughs> First of all, before I leave your dua, which is very important, and uh, our Lord Almighty Allah loves, we beseech Him and we ask Him. Uh, just some comments, and perhaps this will help all of us. And I hope that God puts it in my heart to convey what I will have to tell you. First of all, in this tragedy of what's been happening, we all have come together. Very noticeably, we as leaders from different organizations, people from different areas of the Muslim community have come together and Alhamdulillah displayed a fantastic character and that character is that we all love each other and that we protect each other and that we are here as citizens that Allah Ta'ala has placed here for Australia we want Australia to be prosperous in every field whether it is economic, moral, social or whatever it is and this is embedded 
in our heart, in our mind. So this unity has been displayed. And it is because of this unity, it's because of we sat together that we were able to change certain things in meeting with the Attorney General. We sent him a message that had a ripple effect that Islam cannot be uh, attributed with those exotic words of terrorism and demonic Islam because Islam is protected. It is the revelation, the words of Allah and the words of Allah. <coughs> so on that aspect, you people have displayed that and you have strengthened that and you showed your solid not only for the Muslims, but as Australian citizens. Uh, we must understand, as our brother here was explaining, uh, when he was saying that being thankful to, uh, what name, Paul Bolton, what name? Andrew Bolton. Bolton. Yes, I like to take his word a bit further. And that is from the practice of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I know that you people are heard, we all heard how he speaks. But it is the path, it is the fashion of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never to curse anyone, to pray for him. If you can get from someone who is having evil akhlaq, evil moral, if you can get a nectar of good from him, then use it and change it. This is what we are going to do. We are changing the concept of Muslims that people have. And you know, everybody knows. And what we see with our sisters and our brothers that are meeting with the community, they are meeting mostly with good people. Yes, they are meeting majority with good people. They are good people that are supporting us. As uh, Dr. Rubana has said, that we need to meet up with the redness. But inshallah, that will come. Your continuous support of how you do from your little effort that you are doing, Allah Ta'ala will make it great for you. Now we have to be tolerant. This is a big imtihan for us. We are in Akhir Zaman. There are different fitnas that are coming. And these fitnas have to be addressed. And we have to be knowledgeable about these fitnas, whatever it is. That is one aspect. The other aspect about it, our brother Hamza. He is basically feeling, and maybe he's right. Imam Pierre has not gone to the house of the people that are there. We had reasons as Adi Qadri has said. But most importantly, we need to make dua for our brothers that are arrested. Allah Ta'ala must make it easy for them, easy for their families. It is important for us to do this. It is very, very important. Now, another thing I'm going to tell you. You know, we learn from this, that Quran can be a proof for you on the day of judgment, and Quran can be against you on the day of judgment. These are Allah Ta'ala's laws. Okay? Take the same laws from the terrorism laws, from the laws of this country, which are placed there basically protecting the Australian citizenship, protecting every individual of Australia. They got laws. These people that make the laws, they will use their best ability to enforce these laws. What do we have to do with these laws? We have to ask Allah, Ya Allah, these laws of this constitution and these laws of this terrible laws. Ya Allah, make these laws that benefit us, not to be against us. <laughs> and this is very important, dear brothers and sisters. Somebody can off my feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we need to make this dua. And let me tell you, and I like to share with you certain duas. Jay, and I will make this dua with you, you learn it, and we will learn it also at the same time. First of all, we read Guru Sharif. The Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Nabi, Allahumma Salla Ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Ala Ala Muhammadin, Kuma Sallayta Ala Ibrahim, Ala Ala Ibrahim, Ala Ala Masjid, Allahumma Barik Ala Muhammad, Wa Ala Ala Muhammadin, Kuma Barik Ala Ibrahim, Wa Ala Ala Ibrahim, Ala Ala Masjid. Do you know that the greatest Salutation on the Prophet is this Dua Ibrahim. It is very complicated and inclusive. We start with it. Then we say, Allahumma aina la dhikrika wa shukrika wa husn ibadat. Ya Allah, we need help to remember you, to be thankful to you, to perform our duties towards you perfectly. 
Without your help, we cannot be doing this with the class and sincerity. The greatest dua these days that you must read, and in abundance, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana wa qina adhaba Oh, our Lord, grant us the best of this world and the best of hereafter and save us from the fire of Jannah. Now, this you have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, wala tuhammilna ma la taqata la nabi. Don't make us carry a burden that we cannot carry. Wa'afu anna, wa'afil lana, wa'alhamna, anta maulana kun sunna ala al-kumul ta'ala. Forgive us, have mercy on us, accept our Tawbah, and help us against our enemies who are going to harm us. So we need to make this dua very importantly. And, oh, Ya Allah, change this. Nas'aluka khayri hadal usul wal qanin min al-tustur al-baladina. Nas'aluka khayr fiha. وَنَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ فِيهَا يَا اللَّهُ يَا كَرِيمُ يَا رَحْمَانُ يَا رَحِيمُ أنا يا الله أمام إخوتي وأخواتي من المسلمين فهم من أمة محمة صلى الله عليه وسلم مخلصين محبين دينك ولكتابك ولنبيك ولبلدهم يا الله يا كريم يا الله ينصركم يا الله أجعلنا سببا لمن اقتدى نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم دعاء أو الله make us the reason for others to get hidayat and guidance your effort your love your concern is very important and let me put it to you in the last that there are a lot of things that are said in this room but they are scattered they are distant you need to collate this information and see that all of it is basically connected. We feel different in certain people's views because we are not connecting. We know that you know there are a lot of things you will notice in the discussion goes in circles. Why? Because it is not connecting, so you got to connect it. So this is very, 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 very important that Allah Ta'ala make us among those that serve His deen that serve humanity. One of the greatest ibadat after worshipping Allah is to serve humanity. And we have to ask Allah Dua to ourselves and those people that are writing graffiti, those people that are intimidating and vilifying our people, we must say, Ya Allah, give them hidayat. Ya Allah, bring them closer. You know the story of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he said in the time, but I don't repeat it. He is Rahmatul Lil Alameen, Raufur Rahim Bil Mubinin. Brothers and sisters, with this dua, I like to tell you, may Allah, Allah place your efforts, your sincere efforts, whatever it may be little, in a mizan al haq al the day of Kama, wa akhir dawana. And alhamdulillah, wa bidah. Thank <laughs> you.